opened up a little bit earlier than necessary, but having everybody here from Oakland, Oaxaca, Berlin, the UK, East Bay, the West Coast, the East Coast, everybody that's coming in, it's really awesome to see the diversity in this family. Bavaria and Austria. I had the best cup of coffee in my life in Austria. Really? Yeah, in Vienna. <laughs> There's a place called Cafe Spurl and they have been making, they've been there since like 1823. And they're pretty good at it by now. Wow. Okay. I mean, I'm sure, I, I mean, decades, generations worth of work in coffee making will make somebody good at it. Oh, right. See, um, Saskia agrees that yes, this is an amazing cafe. <laughs> and look at that we got uh, um uh, wahoo we've got um canada well, and the big island this is fucking this is great this is great i appreciate this um dan i want to go ahead and do a quick introduction for you and for the talk and then i'll let you take over if that's okay well let's let it it, it, it just turned 4 30 okay okay let's, okay okay like people still might be popping in in the meantime Ian, do you want to tell us about a a food or drink item that stands out for you with when you were traveling? And why don't people in the chat, like, has anybody been like, like, I remember Austria, like I had an amazing Bronzino and I had an amazing at the night market and I had an amazing cup of coffee. The strudel across from that one museum wasn't terrible either. Have so you I'm ever, wondering voodoo donuts? Have you ever, are you a donut fan? I'll eat, a, I'll eat a voodoo donut. Oh, I had a, okay, I was in Seattle for the first time. I'd never been before. Went to mm -hmm. a bunch of different places, the Rock and Roll Museum, the Space Needle, fun stuff like that. And I had been told by everybody that I had, I was like, what's a good food to get around mm -hmm. here? I'm a sushi fanatic. And everybody was like, oh, you need to get the salmon sushi, blah, 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 blah. I was like, okay, cool. That's fine. What else? And it was at least top five. It wasn't always the top of the list, but it was always top five was Voodoo mm -hmm. Donuts. Maple bacon donut. <laughs> oh, so good. That was mine. Excellent. You know, the only, um, the thing about having a Voodoo Donut is that when it's done, I sort of feel like I need to eat a Voodoo Donut. It's, it, yeah, it makes you want more. Uh, we got snake fruit from Malaysia uh, from Colin. That's a pretty interesting one octopus um chile from valparaiso chile Onion oh, I, i've tuna done tuna. shots of noni on the road to hana in hawaii what's noni it's a terrible tasting fruit that's apparently really really good for you <laughs> fair <laughs> enough like terrible tasting like bitter or like dry mouth kind of a bitter kind of a thing i don't or? remember okay that's how I bad remember, it was i remember it was bad <laughs> Okay, fair, fair. It's like um, people tell me all the time, it's like, oh, you know, I hurt myself. It's like, oh, how much did it hurt? Like, uh, it hurt a lot, but I don't really remember the pain. So it's like one of those foods, like it was so bad, you don't remember it. What else we got? It smells like blue cheese, apparently. Wild yeah. fennel of California, I agree. It's my least favorite flavor, that licorice fennel flavor. Well, you know what Jerry Garcia said about the Grateful Dead? I mean, he said a lot of things. He said a lot of things. Well, he said um, the Grateful Dead is like licorice. Okay. Not everybody likes licorice, but the people who like it really like it. That makes a lot of fucking sense. <laughs> That's two F-bombs you've dropped. I know, I know. Top. I need to stop. I need to stop. I need to stop. As it stands, um, we do have a good crew coming in. I think we're sitting at about almost 70 participants. We're already uh, picking up where we had left off with Teragape, which was an amazing musical performance. It was really nice. It was nice to move my body. I was very thankful for also um, the continuation of the artwork that Emily is providing us as well. Right, it's a, it's a journey. These three cats are on a journey. Four, we're on a journey with these four cats. I like the middle cat the most because he has his third eye open. <laughs> oh, ooh, we have another one. Stinky Tofu in, I, I don't know how to pronounce the name, but Guilan, I think China. Cheesy old sock flavor. 
that's his own part. That's his own, Dr. That's part Sandra, um, I'll talk to the artists and see what we can do. There has been a really positive, a positive love of the both ketamine unicorn and the mushroom kittes. <laughs> Maybe we'll release them as NFTs. <laughs> Yeah, those non-fungible tokens, the the uh, virtual, the digital art, kind of blockchain digital art, I guess. Mm -hmm. It's I can appreciate that. I think that would be really good to uh, support um, not just the artist, but also um, the integration circles and things like that. If people like them after the fact, you could have them available later on. Well, we actually, so Sarah, we actually have some psychedelic memes released as NFTs on the Tezos platform here and now. If you go to psychedelicnft.xyz, there are some. This is great. There some I, very, there's some very, very silly, inexpensive NFTs. <laughs> I mean, heck, Dogecoin is now at 35 cents. So you know what? You never know the value of things. Right. One doge equals one doge. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to go ahead and get started, friend? It is 135. Let's do it. Awesome possum. Well, today we are going to be engaging a conversation about consciousness-based integration and the practical ethics of the Yoga Sutras of Patananj. Nanjali? Patananjali? Patanjali. Patanjali. I always am I'm bad at pronunciation. Um, Thankfully, we have Dan, who is not. Uh, Daniel Sitaram Das Schenken is the founder of Mount Tam Psychedelic Integration, which supports individuals who are exploring their consciousness for spiritual growth and transformational healing. He's a dear friend and really heart-spoken genius in his own ways. So please give him a warm welcome. Feel free to ask questions in the chat. We'll do our best to tackle them at the end. A genius in his own way. <laughs> Thanks. It's a compliment. It really is. It really is. All right, everybody. Hi, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for continuing the journey with us at the uh, Integration Jam. I'm really happy to be sharing this information with you. And, you know, even if we never speak again, I think that it will be helpful, useful, you know, maybe even life changing. I'm also an integration coach. And at the and I will drop a link with a little form in there if you would like to talk to me about integration coaching. We can do, you know, a 30 minute little mini thing. And that's always sweet. You know, I'll get back to you as, as soon as possible and, and we'll, we'll get it going. And I'll put that form in at the end. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, the Yoga Sutras, uh, the Yoga Sutras as a model for psychedelic integration. Uh, the reason that I want to do this is because a lot of my integration process of my own psychedelic journeys didn't happen uh, through therapy. I, I did some amount of therapy when I really needed. I had very, very intense experiences in the 90s coming out of college. There was not a lot of ceremonial therapeutic use that I knew about, and I pushed it really hard. And at the same time, I was doing yoga practice and I was studying Eastern philosophy and things of that nature. Of course, I want to recognize that um, I'm not of Indian descent, right? This is not my first culture. And, you know, I can only give you the um, information as I see it. And there, and I, and I just try to do the best I can as sincerely as I can. Um, so as I started to study these things, you know, and I was using psychedelics, things got really, really big. Things got, and, and I got really tuned into all of the ways that I sort of fell short of the path, if you will. All of the ways that, you know, if you want to achieve the goal of yoga, right, you start to see all of the things that get in your way. And that can be kind of a hard place to be. And the only real answer to that, the only solution for that is to actually do more yoga practice. And so I found myself as the assistant manager of a yoga studio taking yoga just like, you know, every day, 
you know, sometimes a couple of classes, a couple of classes a day, and had the opportunity to study with a lot of um, really amazing teachers from all around the world. They would come through the yoga studio and teach workshops, and I got to go. It was really, really a good practice. And and this helped me to ground. Um, you know, what I found is that I needed a lot, a lot of grounding. That one of the things that psychedelics do, for better or worse, is they sort of destabilize our system. They destabilize our energy. They destabilize our mind, right? And sometimes that looks like dissolving into bliss. And sometimes it creates a certain amount of, of confusion and difficulty. And it is sometimes difficult to kind of use the mind to fix the mind, right? But what can be really, really helpful is to just get into the body, to climb into the body and to do a practice diligently and with discipline and that can, that can cultivate insight and awareness, right? And so that's kind of what I was doing, you know, as best I can. I was like 24 at the time. So it's 20 years ago. And I will share my screen, Ian, I hope that you can manage this. I'm going to pop in and out of the screen so that we make sure that we can see Lauren Thanks for being here, Lauren. And we can see Emily and the kitties. Yes, I will make sure I can get it to work for us. So. And so let's go up here and go to present. And then I'll share my screen. Love it. And there it is. Okay, so this is my teacher, Bethela, and one of my other teachers, Ed, and Bethela passed um, almost a decade ago at this point, um, but one of the things she, she taught me, right, was that if you don't follow yama and niyama, you're going to descend into a foul pit of hell. I think this is a great topic, right? So yama and niyama are basically the ethical precepts that go along with yoga practice, and, and as far as I could tell, you know, there are things like, don't, don't lie don't cheat, don't steal, right? These kinds of things. And, and it just seemed like, okay, so there's these basic ethical qualities and you should follow them. And then what Bethelah was teaching me, if you don't follow them, she would say, you can't actually break yama and niyama. Mm. You can only break yourself against yama and niyama. And so this was this kind of paradigm shift of we need to do these practices almost to be good neighbor, like we want to be good neighbors, right? We want to be good members of the community, but really we're doing these practices to protect ourselves, right? Because in this model, there's sort of a very fast acting karma can be happening. So the idea of that, if I am, am dishonest, mm -hmm. right? If I'm taking things that aren't mine, if I'm hurting other people, if I'm greedy or lazy or undisciplined or grasping in some way that the real detriment is is to me mm. as as the practitioner and so that was really kind of mind-blowing that was really a, a good shift because what i needed was um a framework for my mind and my consciousness that would help me as i navigated through alternative kinds of consciousness spaces of consciousness and so this comes this the system comes from people who are working with altered consciousness for years and whether it's um, plant induced or not or breathing mm. or fasting or just practice um, these people are used to working in altered states and are wanting to do so in a way that is safe and i also want to i was through a quote in here with a picture of my dad my dad used to tell me you can't cheat an honest man right and i've sat with that for a long time too he goes you know if you if you if you buy a VCR off the back of a truck in an alley and it doesn't work, you really don't have anybody but yourself to blame was mm. the example that he used. So if you're honestly engaging with the things that you're engaging with, you're, you won't be upset because you're not, you don't have any illusions about the well, thing. If you're like, yeah, like if you're not the kind of person who just like buys stolen merchandise out of an alley, like you can't get taken advantage of the guys who sell stolen merchandise in an alley. Makes sense. Um, and it goes on and on like this. Like if, if you're really sat in your center, 
I, I had a great conversation yesterday about narcissistic abuse in psychedelic communities and um, it's prevalent also in spiritual communities as well. Mm. And it would be really nice to think that we can just stop all the narcissists for, from doing narcissist things, but that's hard. You know, what we can do is get really honest with ourselves and really clear about our boundaries and really grounded in our centers. And so we're less prone to being sucked into abusive things, right? A lot of the times, you know, when I have found myself, because, you know, you, you run around a yoga community for 20 years, you know, you're bound to meet a couple of abusive narcissists. Sure. And usually what I have found is that when I have been roped into those kinds of situations, there was, um, there is, how do you say this? Always something that I wanted to. I was glamorized somehow. You um, were glamorized or you were entranced by the glamour? Right. I was entranced by the glamour. There was something that I thought was glamorous. Right. And that I kind of, you know, wanted that was sort mm. of outside of myself that I was like, oh, I, I need to get that. I, you, you know, somehow like I'm not, I wasn't centered. I need that in me. Yeah. And. Hmm. And so learning, to, learning to sit in our center, right. Learning to restrain the fluctuations of the mind. So here is a, I'm going to turn the slides on again. And I want to look at their definition of yoga, of yoga practice. Right, so the definition of yoga in the Yoga Sutras, yoga chitta vritti nirodaha, yoga is the restraint of the fluctuations of the mind. And so what, this is what we were talking about, the fluctuations of the mind, the mind goes here and the mind goes there. Um, it grasps and it rejects and it does all of those kinds of things. Mm. And then the seer can rest in its own true nature. So we're the seer, right? Tara drashtu swarupe vastanam. Right? So what we want to do is rest in our own true nature. When the mind is still, then we can relax and we can be ourselves. And so this term swarupe, right? Which means our own true nature. Rupe is form or nature. And our own is swa. And so here, when we're looking at Swa, Swa also is one of the names of Vishnu, right? It's one of the names of God. And so there's this sense that when we're resting in who we truly are, we're resting in something that's kind of sacred and connected to divine, to the divine, mm -hmm. right? We're not just talking about like our, like Ian and Lauren and Emily and Dan, you know, it's, it's, a, it's something that's kind of deeper and inherently holy. Mm. And so if we can, the, and the problem with the fluctuations, like the fluctuations of the mind wouldn't be a problem except for a few things. And one of them is that it obstructs us from resting in our own true nature. We have thoughts that this is good or this is bad, or this is the other thing, or that I'm good, worse, I'm good, I'm bad, I'm the other thing. And I think that I'm something other than what I really am, right? And so there's this, mistake, this um, case of mistaken identity. And what you really are is connected to this divine thing with inside of you. Right. Oh, right. Except even that's a little more dual than I would like. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I can appreciate that because right. it creates a you and it. Right. So there's a lot of things that I'm not, you know, that it's pretending is masquerading as me. Mm. Right. And so these are the things that the mind tends to do. They tend to engage in something called klesha. Right, it says down there, kleshaha. And it, this is the ignorance, right? And so the first thing we say is this ignorance, is this mistaken identity, is I think I'm something that I'm not, right? And then there's egoism, greed, fear, hatred. And so I'm spending all my time kind of wrapped up in this stuff, right? And this is the stuff that comes up, you know, when we meditate. This is the kind of stuff that comes up when we're doing our psychedelic practices. And hopefully we start to see it for what it is, right? We start to notice that we are not our thoughts, right? These, these thoughts don't really have all that much to do with who we are. 
and that we can sort of let that stuff go, right? Our ideas about who we are, right? Our ideas about what we need to have and what we need to fear, right? We start to like create a little bit more space there, right? Because those things are not really true apprehensions of reality, right? Which brings mm-hmm. us to this thing, right? So it is pramana and viparyaya. And we all know this image of this, um, this, we all know the elephant story, right? That one guy's got a rope, one guy has the tail and he thinks it's a rope and one guy has the side of it and he thinks it's a wall. And so I don't know if you've ever been in a yoga practice where you've had your arms out, you've been in, you're in triangle pose, you're in warrior two pose or something like that. And you're just sure, you're certain that your pose is perfect. It feels really good in the body. You really think you know what's up. You really think you know what's happening. And then out of the blue, the teacher comes out, comes over to you and your arm was like way back out here. And then they like, okay, this is shoulder height, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. right? It's like, we don't even know where our limbs are half the time, right? And the limbs are easier to know than our mind. Right? Mm-hmm. Our mind is more subtle than, than our arms. It's like, should be really, really easy. And yet we think that even though we can't get our arms in the right place, that we're going to be able to have, have some easy control over our mind. And we see when we take, take our medicine, that's not true. The mind is all over the place. And it's really easy to have a lot of misapprehensions. And we see this, you know, in spiritual narcissism. We see it in all kinds of ways that we go wrong when we come out of our psychedelic spaces um, with, you know, grandiosity. Mm-hmm. Um, and people who think they are truly enlightened, people who think they know everything, they've reached some sort of state. And they also kind of gang up in little packs, you know, of, you know, medicine communities where it's just like, you know, the rope, the rope crew. It's like everybody, everybody's holding a tail of an elephant. They all, they all agree. Oh yeah. Reality is like a rope. <laughs> it's turtles, man. Turtles all the way down. Turtles all the way down. And they're just, you know, continually co-signing each other's, each other's shit. Well, I also like to say um, the idea is very much enlightenment is not an accolade to be gained, but a path perpetually walked. Will you say that one more time? Enlightenment is not an accolade to be gained, but a path perpetually walked. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, all of this stuff exists on a continuum. I think that's really important to note that, you know, we sometimes look at things like hatred, Mm. right, or fear, Mm. and we look at it as A, a binary, right? That it's either hatred or love. Right? Mm. That it's either fear or love. And if it's either, and that, and, and that can happen in psychedelics too, this very either or situation. And that can be also Dangerous. very, very problematic. It can be very mm. problematic because then it really leaves a fertile ground for self-hatred mm. right it's like oh or right or wrong it's basically oh man i'm wrong oh maybe i'm right oh maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm right maybe i'm wrong mm. and so you know in this one tradition that i that i work in there is this idea of that all of this exists in a continuum mm-hmm. right and i i really like this picture this is a hilma off klimt and she's got this sort of really cool image that sort of makes me feel that that reminds me of what we're talking about right now is that we have here up at the top is sort of universal consciousness or something like that right the bliss state one's own true nature Mm -hmm. and that there's all of these different sort of layers and continuums and things like that that are happening and so when we have hatred it's not the absence of love it's the energy of love that's been degraded and perverted and twisted it's like they're the, it's like a path that has just been in disrepair. 
Mm -hmm. it, it's sort of like, yeah, a path that's been in disrepair, but it's also really easy to find in our own bodies, right? Like if I find hatred in my own body, we might think if we, we don't want to think surgically, mm. right? That I'm just going to cut out the hatred, right? Because that's, well, I mean, that would probably be fine if it worked. Well, I think if, if, if we're kind of, I'm using this analogy of a path kind of a thing. And mm -hmm. so if we're staying in that mindset, if you choose not to take the rage path, that path is still there. It's not gone. And you can walk it again in the future. Like you might be put in a place where you're presented with that path and you take it. Right. So, I mean, you know, it's, now we're like photon and, you know, like wave and particle. So mm. if we look at things like, if we look at hatred inside the body from like a somatic perspective, mm. right? What we're, you know, fear or, or loathing or something like that in the body, what we find is an expression of consciousness that is just kind of twisted, mm. right? And it feels twisted in the body, right? It, when you talk to people who have these sorts of issues, um, you know, it's painful. Mm. And so, you know, a big part of the integration process is flowing enough sensitivity, presence, openness, love, and care to that energy of the body so that it can release and open. And sure, some parts will fly away, you know, some things will be released, but what is ending up happening is that energy that has been bound up in all of this ignorance, hatred, all of these modifications of the mind starts to loosen, right? Like and so that energy can up kind of, they can, it, itself one of my teachers would say self liberates right and so that's kind of what we're looking for we're looking for this energy to liberate itself back into space mm. uh, so like i was going to say with the the dammed up river idea it's like it's a little bit of water will get stopped by fallen trees but a large enough torrent will lift those trees and move out and cleanse that space that stoppage yeah i don't know if tree is the right word Fair. I mean, what I'm thinking of, like, if, like, just imagine you were really sad and like curled up in the fetal position. Mm. And then I rubbed your back until you felt better. And then you, you know, came out of the fetal position and were able to be happy again. Mm. It's so the energy stoppage was in a closed loop. And then you coming in and rubbing the back opens that space up to a different path than it was closed to well it's the thing is it, it's love is its true nature so love's mm -hmm. your true nature mm -hmm. Agreed. and and love is where you want to be and so a little bit of external love can go a long way hmm Mm. that's all it's not that complicated i don't think well you're a beautiful person and i love you friend thank you i love you too all right so i do want to talk a little bit we do have some more time i want to talk about the yama i want to get back to yama and niyama mm -hmm. right and so what what she's saying bethel is saying is if you neglect yama and niyama you're going to end up you're going to find yourself in a foul pit of hell mm-hmm Right. And so this is what she's talking about. If you ignore kind of these universal ethical precepts, your consciousness is going to twi end up twisted up into those balls, mm. up into those balls of, of the fetal position of feeling disconnected from love. Right. And so there are five yamas and they are considered to be, let's do our slides again. So one of the things they say about yama is that they are great universal commitments unlimited by any circumstance. So these are things that you're supposed to, you, like you, this is really where you want your consciousness at all times. And there's a couple of ways to look at them. And what the way we've been taught mostly is that they're activities. Um, but I want us to look at them as aspects of consciousness, right? So we are ultimately, again, we're ultimately love, we're ultimately consciousness. 
and our consciousness, this consciousness, I don't even want to say our consciousness because it assumes that there's something separate. So this consciousness has particular qualities. And so let me just go to that. So the yamas, ahimsa, satya, asteya, brahmacharya, aparigraha, yamaha, right? And so we're probably, but many people are, are pretty familiar with ahimsa and people make it say it means nonviolence, right? And they talk a lot about vegetarianism and things like that. And satya is truth telling and asteya means don't steal things. And brahmacharya means celibacy. And a parigraha means don't be greedy. And so that's usually how they're taught. If we massage these a little bit, and this was some work with, I did with a guy named Godfrey Devereaux, um, likes to look at these as, again, as qualities of consciousness. And so one of the things that we find we do our psychedelic, we, we, we have powerful breakthrough psychedelic experiences, we find that these qualities feel better. And that these qualities are, in fact, part of who we are and who we want to be. And a big part of our integration, if we are integrating from a perspective of consciousness, is that we are trying to embody and bring these qualities through more often and allow these qualities of consciousness that is who we truly are to inform our lives, right? And so mm -hmm. nonviolence is like sensitivity. You know, and if you guys are, 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 if folks are still listening, um, you know, what if you take a few breaths into sensitivity? Mm -hmm. Like we could create that, a vibratory field of sensitivity. How many folks do we have? 90 something. People. Yeah. So, you know, 95 people in like Bavaria and Oaxaca and, and the UK and Canada and all over the, the United States. And it's like, if we just like turn ourselves to sensitivity for a moment and can we make a universal commitment to ourselves to continue to turn up our sensitivity mm. and to allow it to be the expression of who we are, right? And then honesty right? What does honesty feel like in the nervous system? Clean. <laughs> That's good. Yeah. And then openness. You know, I like the idea of, you know, if, a, if stealing is almost like, you know, you're, you're grabbing, you know, there's like the openness of the palm. Mm. That sort of thing, the openness of the mind. Openness of the heart. Openness of the heart. Right, there was one, I was in a ceremony once and a woman came over and gave me flower petals. And they were like the, they were beautiful and they symbolized love and all this kind of stuff. And, uh, and I held onto them tight. I was a little guy. And I was holding on to them and they got kind of gross and sticky, you know, like rose petals would do if you held on to them in your fist. And I was a little freaked out, but I called her back over and I was like, my rose petals are like, they're not, they're not love anymore. And she was like, yeah, you held on to them too tight. She was like, why don't you give them away? I'm going to give you more and I want you to give them away. I was like, oh yeah, works, makes sense. Mm. Presence right, is a quality of our consciousness. And so can we just, and this is one of the wonderful things, this is why integration circles work. Integration circles is a training ground for all of these stuff, all of these things, but especially presence. Mm -hmm. And so if we're just right here in our center, and this presence again, is the thing, because it's, it's associated with, with celibacy, and we think about um, all of like the sexual ethic violations that happen. And when we just stay in our center, mm -hmm. right? So we're not trying to abuse anybody or take advantage of anybody or anything like that. We're sitting, we're sitting in our center. And then the spirit of generosity, right? And just to sort of 
um, saying nice things about all of the presenters here today. It's like there's <laughs> all the presenters this weekend. It's like such generosity of spirit, all of these people who are willing to work with us, you know, at such a high level. And so I just hope you are, you know, if, if you're listening, what I, what I would suggest is like, look at these five qualities and see where you're strong and see where you're weak. Right. It's like, which, or, or which of those vibrations as we ran through them together felt really, really good to you. Do you feel like your system like really wants more of if you run through it? Like which of these qualities, if you brought it into your home would benefit your family, it would benefit your children. Mm. it goes on to say that sensitivity generates love mm -hmm. right one of the things they say if you know if the yogi practices um ahimsa enmity ceases in his presence right violence you know if somebody is totally nonviolent, it's hard to be violent around them so they say it's the myth right i know we live in a more complicated world honesty leads to fulfillment Openness elicits abundance. Presence confers vitality. And generosity leads to selflessness. All good things. You know, this is what Patanjali says. and He's mostly right about most things. And so these qualities, you know, the, the yamas, these are called the restraints. Yama means restraint. Means to like hold back in some ways. Um, and it's really interesting to look at it in terms of all of these things which are uh, spoken in the positive, right? It's like, we're not really restraining, we're just changing the channel. We're changing, we're changing the channel to that which is more authentically us. Well, in yoga, don't you quote unquote, bind positions? Sure. And that's an intentional form of restraint. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so sometimes, so the thing is, is that there's kind of two kinds of austerities, really. I mean, maybe. Let's see where we go with this. But there's two, there's two kinds of ways to do austerities. Mm. And austerity is a restraint of some kind, right? It's mm. some sort of practice. Choosing not to do something. Choosing not to do something. Or choosing to do something very, very difficult, like sit in front of a fire. You know, sit like sit in the center of like four hot fires and meditate. And it's just sweating like a sweat lodge is an austerity. Because mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess, you know, what you're doing is not getting up and leaving. Right. So maybe an act of will. That's that's part of it. Now, here's the other thing is that on one level, it's an act of will. Right. It's like maybe. Not stealing is an act of will mm. right? i would agree i would agree or maybe not stealing is just something that you don't want to do because you're more sensitive and honest and tuned into the feelings of other people right so there's kind of two guys and then the thing is as i have seen this in monastic people mm. i have met monks who are celibate and who have taken vows of poverty and things things like that and it suits them and they are super blissed out and happy and kind and they glow with divine love and it's wonderful and i have met monks who are celibate and have taken vows of poverty and they are neurotic as can be you know they're not happy people like they really should like like they're not doing it for the right reasons they're trying to force themselves into a shape Mm. right that there either is is you know maybe not appropriate for them maybe there's something they need to learn i don't know but it's it's really interesting the difference between an austerity that is happening because it's just who we are anyway mm -hmm. and and the austerity that we're sort of forcing ourselves into right so like i don't have to tell you ian mm -hmm. like not to punch grandmas true right like it was just it'd be inconceivable to you to like run around and just punch grandmas right 
not inconceivable, but it's very, it's like 99% <laughs> chance I'm not going to do it. Right. And so, you know, you're not a violent guy and you're kind to people for the most part. And that's just sort of like the, the vibratory level that you're working with, where there are some people out there that it's like a struggle not to punch grandmas, right? Then they're really working hard at it. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what we want to do in our integration practice is sort of find the, you know, and, and probably the folks in our crowd is like grandma punching is not really the big problem, but, you know, we all have, we go into ceremonies and it's like, okay, I need to clean up my food or I need to clean up my sex or I need to clean up my addictions and those sorts of things. And it can be really hard to white knuckle that stuff. Mm -hmm. So just do that by brute force. And to do that with a mind that is twisted in the ways that we've been talking about, right? And so it's sort of like the compulsion to unhealthy food is like in our consciousness deep, mm -hmm. right? Like it's, it's really like talking to people about food stuff is like really divisive. Yes. And I would agree. It's actually, I think I, I, I'm going to make a parallel here to what you were saying and to tie it kind of together what you're preaching. Yoga as a practice helps us to, we call it practice. It helps us to build strength in these ways. So this, these austerities that you're mentioning, we need to practice to build them in that mm -hmm. way. Right. And so we need to practice and That is where some of these qualities can come in because it's one thing to say, okay, I'm just like, it's like, don't think about cake. It's like, try that. That's no fun. Like I would never tell a coaching client, okay, we well, just don't think about cake. You know, and, and whereas if we start to like embody new qualities mm -hmm. and allow ourselves to be informed by new ways of being, Right, that are more in line with our consciousness, it's a big deal. Something like sensitivity, openness, all of mm -hmm. these different qualities that we want to bring in that we might not necessarily be bringing in. And we can do, it's, mm -hmm. it's kind of interesting. It's like we, we make space for them and that's the restraint is you making space for these things to come in. Yes. Yes, there is, you know, there, there's two limbs to this. There's like the don't do stuff that's not aligned mm -hmm. and then do stuff that is aligned. I call it the please, yes, please, no. It's not a bad way of putting it. So, you know, finding a balance here because a lot of us are so wrapped up in our self-criticism, right? I talk to so many people who, you know, they come in and they're like, I need to fix my food. I need to fix my food. I need to fix my sex. I need to fix my work-life balance. I'm no good here. I'm no good there. Um, you know, I'm basically a psychopath and da, 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 da. And it's just, they want to tell me all about how they're wrong. Mm. And all I can say is like, wow, there's like really a process. There's really a mental process of self-blame going on right now. Mm. Mm. Right. It's like, and the thing that's tricky is that that person probably could eat better. Mm -hmm. That pro person probably could look at less porn. Mm. You know, that probably, person probably could be nicer, you know, and, and more productive in their workplace. So the tricky thing is, is like, we've got all these legitimate things, but they're being pointed out by a flawed system that is full of hatred. I hear you. And that's, that's, it's the lens by which we're approaching it through that hurts our ability to grow. Yeah. You can't do it because the fit, like, if you just have a bully you know, n knocking you in the back of the head all the time. Mm -hmm. um, the bully's like invested in, in you screwing up. And so even if you do eat perfect, have you heard of orthorexia? No. Orthorexia is a fascinating, it, it popped up in, uh, I first heard about it in like 2002. Mm. Um and I was in a yoga teacher training at the time and we all laughed because we were all orthorexic. And it is 
an eating I, I, i'm cured I, I want you all to know that i'm cured mm. it's an eating disorder that is characterized by um being obsessed with pure and clean and healthy foods mm. so everything okay. has to be organic right everything's got to be vegan everything has to have spirulina in it and you have to eat just absolutely perfectly but then it's characterized by binging in some way mm -hmm. right like you can't keep it you can't do that forever especially if it's motivated by self-hatred of feeling not good enough i will be good enough if i manage to do this um in this self-critic you can't and keep that up forever it's not a stable foundation mm -hmm. right it's not a firm ground and so eventually you eat something you know it's like you know your roommate comes home and it's like oh here's that cake that i went to that party and they leave the cake overnight and you eat it or something like that um it's never happened to me i can't relate um and well, then that unstable footing just like in a yoga pose you're trying to stand on one foot you and then you know what happens after and then you know what happens after you binge on the cake you lose your balance you punish yourself oh yeah the self-deprecation mm -hmm. you punish yourself and then you double down on your efforts to like and then you have to do a fast you know then you've got to do the master cleanse or you have to you know drink olive oil and grapefruit juice to cleanse your liver things like that mm. and so it is just this like really bizarre um flagellation mm -hmm. that is not coming from anywhere good it's not coming from the place of love that we're talking about right it's not it's not really coming um oh people want to people want have like I, I just looked at this question we do have people, some questions i was gonna say do you want to dive into some of those because we do have a number of good ones um i don't i don't really want i mean the ethics of serving medicine during the pandemic um i don't necessarily think that's a great idea um i mean i'll just i'll just say that I don't think that's necessarily a good idea. And I would I would suggest that you go to the narcissism talk that's going on later. I think it's later today, actually. Um, they're gonna be talking about a lot of the kind of mental twists. Uh, I'm, I mostly want to talk about um, these qualities of, of the sort of creating an ethical framework for ourselves as mm -hmm. practitioners. I, I don't really want to um, talk about the problems that other people are having or the bad things other people are doing. I want us to kind of fulfill ourselves and to like have a, a mini experience of like cultivation of qualities. Like we did, we did a very brief meditation on sensitivity, honesty, openness, presence, and generosity. And it's not because I don't think those things are important, but I actually think that it's more important. There's one of the things in, in, in the yoga sutras is there's a practice called self-study. Sure. Svadhyaya, there's that sva again, mm. right? study of the self. It does not necessarily say study of other people and what they're doing wrong. Mm -hmm. And while, you know, I would hope that you wouldn't participate in anything that feels dangerous to you, um, I want us to focus on us right now. Mm. And so, um, one of the big things that kind of resonates with me just you know, as the through line through this conversation has always been the idea that if we do the practice, if we show up and do the work, that's us showing up for ourselves and then in turn allows us to show up for those around us. If somebody says, you know, hey, I'm not sure I'm doing this stance right in yoga, if you've been practicing it correctly and you've been corrected enough times, you might have the capacity to help that person correct. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. And again, it's, we're the navigators, right? We're the psychonauts. Mm -hmm. We're moving through psychedelic space. Mm -hmm. We're even moving through psychedelic space like all, all the time, right? At some point, it's just a question of degrees, right? Yeah. It's like I close, I, I close my eyes and meditate and, you know, I'm at like, you know, on a scale of one to 10 of trippy, like, you know, it's like about, a, it's a two or a three, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, okay, this is like a psychedelic space, but you know, my mind still wanders to bills and, and, you know, podcasts and other things, mm -hmm. you know, a little mm -hmm. more than if I take an entheogen and it, it's dialed up to 11 and there's nothing for me to do, but hang on. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I think is um, 
also ties to this I, in some ways in my head is the idea that when we're we have these different divisions we had talked about earlier about like the the negative aspect of these intentions and and we're trying to look at the these austerities and now we want to look at the positive it's mm -hmm. like we don't want to talk about what we're doing wrong we want to talk about what we can do right because that's the path we should be taking for the next steps like we might have faltered in the past we might have taken a road that was a little under disrepair but now we we're past that do we want to stay on that road or do we want to go on a different path? And that's kind well, of what I mean. You lost me at should. Have to. Okay, okay, okay. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> okay. Should should is should is one of those moral obligation words that it, it can be very dangerous to use sometimes. So I can appreciate. Or so problematic. Problematic to use. It can be problematic. And because you're gonna do what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. Like there's no way around that you're gonna do what you're gonna do. Mm -hmm. And, you know, somebody says, if it's difficult to commit to just one practice, mm. uh, potentially at the cost of not learning one particular skill deeply. Yeah, that's, that requires some discipline. I, one of my other teachers said, make sure you find a practice that you like more than television. Otherwise, you would, um, you would watch television be beholden to someone else's programming. And so, you know, there's a whole path of yoga called bhakti yoga, which is the yoga of love and devotion. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of bhakti yoga. It's like, there are times when I don't, and my body's changing as I age too. It's like, I'm not doing stuff I did when I was 25, now that I'm 45. And I've got, a, you know, I've got a couple of weird injuries, you know, from doing, I probably shouldn't have been doing this stuff when I was 20. <laughs> but, but I can always chant. You can, I, I can always like bring my heart to the altar mm. and, and chant. And so, you know, finding, finding a practice to commit to, yeah, it's difficult. And I would just suggest that, you know, stay in the work and do some stuff, right? Stay in the work and do some stuff. It's better, but then notice what is pulling you out. So when somebody says it's difficult to commit to one practice, what I'm hearing is what I'm believe what I'm projecting. It's a projection. Mm. Is, and there's a, a story about this. This is you know the story of the well diggers. You know, um, you know you dig a, you dig three feet and, and your shoulder hurts and so you stop, and then you go over there a little bit and shake out your shoulder. You dig another three feet, and so people do this all the time with practices, and they'll do tai chi for six months. And then they'll decide, oh, well, I don't like the other people who do Tai Chi. I'm going to do spirit dancing. And mm -hmm. they do spirit dancing for the same for six months. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, the teacher, I don't like him. And then they go and they do yoga practice. And I was like, oh, it's too expensive. And it happens every six months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so what we're seeing is that it takes six months for that person to bump up against their shadow to an extent that they just kind of quit so that they don't have mm -hmm. to deal with what they have to deal with in order to gain the insight. Mm. It's, and so it's, I would just really look at like the pattern of dropping out and quitting. And that's a, it's a, it's the best way to be able to tackle the not being able to commit or finding it difficult to commit to that one practice. Yeah. Yeah. yeah because again, it's sort of like, Oh, I finally have become vegan, but now I hate myself for not running jogging far enough. You know, you're dealing with with it's you're dealing with a broken system. You're not dealing with individual phenomena. Mm. Mm. Will you read Jenny's question to me real quick? How could we look at presence of certain clashes within us in accordance slash relation to the presence of traumas in a self compassionate way? We the traumas are, are there. Mm -hmm. I don't, I only barely understand this. So we want to, she, we're trying to look at presence of these, I, of these, um, the, the clashes themselves with relation to the presence of trauma and how can we look at these things together? So like, I believe earlier, somebody mentioned that being open to sensitivity tends them up. Mm, cool awareness, cool, cool awareness. Um, and so that might, you would want to take that gently. 
Mm, mm, mm. Right? I want to actually like, give that person a shout out. Um, why would you force yourself to be sensitive? Yeah. Does it make any sense? You want to be, then, you, then all of a sudden you're just being sensitive to resistance. Okay. As resistance arises, this is an opportunity for me to notice, be open and compassionate. Mm. Um, but I wouldn't necessarily um, draw a one-to-one -one correspondence that if this happened to you, you're going to have more of this, or this happens to you, you have more of this. We, we have what we have, you know, we coped the way that we have coped. And so just like if somebody has a frozen shoulder, you mm. wouldn't just wrench that thing open all at once. Mm. You know, it's like, okay, it's like, what, how do we, like, what is your range of motion? There mm -hmm. is a great book by Eric Schiffman called The Practice of Yoga, The Practice of Moving Into Stillness, mm -hmm. where he talks a lot about playing your edge. And I think playing your edge is something that is so useful to us in all of our lives. Mm -hmm. is that we find right at the comfort zone. You know, there's all of these sort of very aggressive rah-rah kind of coaches that want to like push you outside your comfort zone all at once. And, you know, it's like, it's, it's sink or swim kind of thing. And I don't, mm -hmm. I don't do that much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a question of how do you get up to where you're comfortable mm -hmm. and to where you're not and kind of lean into it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like, if you do a yoga practice, for example, or you lift weights, and you lift too many weights, you stretch too far and you hurt yourself, then you're out of the game. Mm -hmm. You can't practice, you can't practice the next day. Mm -hmm. You know? What is it? Um, there was actually a question here that I think kind of ties into this. It's the recommendation of Vipassana meditation. Personally, I would say yes. Um, depends. Fair. Not for everybody, not for some people with some trauma profiles or some anxiety profiles. Really? Okay. I've not heard of that before. I'm interested in hearing that. Um, yeah, there's some people that'll, it'll nutty them right out. It, that the, that breath work specifically for Vipassana meditation will actually okay. take them into an anxious state. Yeah. I, I mean, it can do, I mean, depending on your psychological profile, like there's no one size fits all, mm. like not all meditation works for all people. And if you have people who are in like particular tender states, mm. you, you don't want to do that. The 10 days, like, have you done one? That's fair. Have you done an hour a day for 10 days? So it's like How the shoulder thing. You, you, you want to work around it. You want to be soft with it before you mm -hmm. do the actual work. Yeah. So mm -hmm. one person wanted to ask for a quick summary of what was said because they had missed out. Do you think you could maybe do like a, a short brief, maybe yeah. like elevator, elevator spiel? Well, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask us to breathe into sensitivity again. Okay. This is what we did. This is all, this is, this was all, all of my yapping was a trick to get you to like take five breaths into the quality of sensitivity. And then let that sensitivity in your body, in your breath, just change ever so slightly as if you're just, it's almost as if it's, you're playing with one of those LED lights. You're just turning it from sensitivity to honesty. You're just feeling the quality of honesty in your body. And then just shift the quality of honesty to the quality of openness. And then shift that openness to the quality of presence. And then just shift the quality of presence to the quality of generosity.
And so that's the summary. The summary is that all of those qualities are innate within you, mm-hmm. that those are closer to being who you truly are as, any, as anything else. As all of the things that you think are wrong with you, that there are at least five things that are deeply, deeply right. Mm-hmm. That was a great summary, Cool. I'm glad you thought so. And so that is, so that's the first half of my presentation. Um, But I guess it's good for an hour. I have a tendency to try and pack too much in. Um, Yeah, thank you, Ian, for helping me keep the ball in the air. And thank you, Lauren, for masterful AS, what I can only assume is masterful ASL. All I know is this. Which is eat more. You want more food? I want more food. That's what my I, son does. I and have a personal favorite. All done. All done. He does Mom, please sometimes. I like turtle milkshake. I do know milk. Milky. Yeah. So turtle, milk, and shake. And thank you, Emily. Thank you, Emily, for drawing some aliens, some mushrooms, and stuff like that. Your lovely tattooed arms. And, oh, I promised you guys a form. So this will probably only be up today uh, because I expect that it'll get pretty full. And if you would like to have a half hour to talk about whether or not working um, together would be a good idea, then, oh wait, that's only to panelists. Then please fill this out and we'll, you know, give me, I'll, I'll email you back within 24 hours, but it might, might have to schedule a week or two out because I need a little bit of a break after this. <laughs> but I'm grateful for all of you because you could be doing anything in the world. You could be doing any digital conference in the world today and you're here um, learning about this stuff that's very dear to my heart with some of the people that I respect most in the world. And I hope that it all just serves you super, super well. And I'll see you, I'm moderating a panel in 15 minutes. And so I will see you there. And if you wanna hang out in the Ozo room, then you're welcome to do that too. Oh my God, Danielle's here. And Aaron Orsini's here. And Clive Worsley too. And Clive is here. I'm sorry, see everybody who's here like Santiago and Cedar Sky and Marissa, um, hopefully like next year, I'll be like, oh my God, it's Cedar Sky Love. <laughs> Just you know, friends I haven't met yet. Well, uh, Brian friends that we're building relationships with. We're Brian building Brian O'Rourke, relationships. much love. What's that, Ian? We're building relationships. The people in Oaxaca and Berlin, in the UK, in the Big Island, we're building these relationships. Right, John Clinton. I went to high school with John Clinton. <laughs> and he, now he's on the team. So some of you may have spoken to John. Thank you so much for all your help. All right. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, you know, just, I want to just, again, just dedicate, you know, the, everything we've done here, all the benefit that we've gained. I just want to take a moment to just hope and pray that it goes off and, and blesses all beings that everybody should be benefited, be free from harm and be full of the causes of happiness. Um, much love. All the love, friend.